Uh, I'm originally from Jackson, Michigan. Um, I moved here in 2007 to Lexington. Um, I joined the Army Reserves in 2009. Uh, I went to a Catholic school my whole life and lived in the suburbs. I was never really outside. Me and my dad would go fishing. But that's, I was the son he never had. I only had one sister. Well, me and my, uh, my sister, it was a love-hate relationship while we lived together. Uh, when she finally went to college, she's older than me. When she went to college, we actually became closer because we didn't have to deal with each other and be in each other's space. Um, I was always close with my mom and dad. Of course, I was the typical teenage girl, so I disagreed with them a lot. But we loved each other and we're very close now. I talk to them on the phone every day now. Yeah. But. Um, you know, I never really had anything growing up that made me think, you know, I'm going to go in the military. But throughout all my, all my school years, I just went with the flow. I never thought of what I was going to do. I thought I was going to work with horses. I loved horses. I was always outside. Um, nothing really led up to it. And then in 2007, um, the year I graduated, uh, I thought about it and I thought, well, that could be really good for me. I was in a Catholic school, so it really wasn't a thing a lot of people talked about doing because most kids were going to college. Mm -hmm. And I, th I started thinking about it. Um, then my sister was uh, dating a guy in the Army. He was an 88 Mike. Uh, he ended up dying on a second tour in Iraq. And so I kind of put that on hold for a couple of years because she was dealing with that. But then that really got it going. I thought, well, what is so great that he volunteered to go back a second time of his own free will? It wasn't, he wasn't forced to go. And so then I started doing my research. Well, at first I thought I wanted to be infantry and I was sadly mistaken. I couldn't be. Um, so I just ended up just walking into the recruiter and I said, Tell me about the Army. I knew I wanted to be Army. I don't know why I knew. Um, but I said I want to know more about it. And so he gave me a whole bunch of things. And I read over them. And I came back in. And I said, OK, I want to sign up. Well, what do you want to do? Well, I still have no idea. I wanted to be infantry. And he said, well, you being a female, uh, military police is probably as close as you can get to infantry. So I said, well, where do I sign? <laughs> so I did not tell anyone. I, my family all still lives in Jackson, Michigan. So I still live down here. So they didn't know I was going to the recruiter. They didn't know I was leaving my apartment. I just went and did it. And I called my mom after I'd already signed up and got told my date for basic. And I said, mom, what would you think if I went into uh, the military? I got an earful, and about 10 minutes after she stopped yelling at me, I told her, too late, I already did, sorry, I love you. <laughs> what did she say? Uh, she was not happy. She'll always support me in everything I do, but she didn't understand why I was doing it, and I was her baby girl. I'm a girl, she shouldn't have to worry about it, you know? And, um, she wasn't very happy that I was willingly about to put myself in danger. <laughs> Especially since it's 2009, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan have been going on. It wasn't peacetime. <laughs> um, I honestly don't think I would have joined if it was peacetime. Um, I joined to go over there. Um, I wanted to be a part of it. I saw all these things on the news and I knew that wasn't the full story. You hear or you speak to, to veterans that have come back and they're telling you, you know, it's about the camaraderie. It's about you know, it's, it's about the whole experience you personally have. It's not about the politics and the news stories. And I wanted, I wanted to feel that. I wanted to go over there and know what it was like and know that I was, I had my friends' backs. And it was, I think it was the camaraderie, really, of being over there. I think, I just, I never had that that deep of a connection, I knew that uh, there was greater friendship and camaraderie out there. I mean, I, like I said, I had friends, mm -hmm. but it was never, it wasn't to the point where I thought it could be like, mm -hmm. you know, having somebody you trusted your life to. Mm -hmm. No offense to my friends mm -hmm. back home, but mm -hmm. just knowing somebody had my back, like, that's a whole different level to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. 
it, it didn't make me pause because I was scared it would happen to me um, because I'm a daredevil and I don't think about things like that before I do it. But um, it made me wonder if my sister could take knowing that her little sister is going to go and she already lost somebody over there. And that was obviously the, that was the closest thing I think I ever got to, to being, having some loved one die over there. And, and it was her boyfriend. I was just, I was very scared that she wouldn't be able to take it, but she did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was actually the, the, the rock yeah. for my parents. So That's my sister, the whole time, she never questioned me. She said, I know you have somebody watching over you. I know they're going to take care of you. She's like, you're fine. I know. She was, I thought she would be the one that yelled the most. <laughs> mm -hmm. To be honest, I thought military police were just going to ride around. If I did anything stateside, I was going to be riding around in cop cars, pulling people over, and that's not what I wanted. But, and then overseas, I really had no idea. All I knew was that my recruiter told me I was as close to infantry as I could get, so I said, fine, <laughs> well, I'll take whatever. I figured if I, if I was going to do it, I wanted to get the full experience. I didn't want to wind up sitting around and doing nothing. I thought, you know, I'm going to be in it, and if you're going to do something, do it well. So if I had to go all in, that's what I wanted. I didn't want some job I could do back here. Mm -hmm. I had been away from home for two years already. So leaving my family, which I think was the hardest thing for everyone there, being away from your loved ones, I had already been there, done that. I wasn't worried about it. Um, we got there and I remember them yelling at us to get off the bus, treating us like we were idiots, which we were in military terms looking at us. We were stupid. We didn't know anything. And uh, I just remember our first, uh, our first PT test that we had, uh, it was like half the workout. You did one minute push-ups, one minute sit-ups, and a one mile run. And I remember doing that and thinking, I am so, so out of shape. Like I can't even do four push-ups at this point. I am convinced it's something in the food there. Um, but after that, I realized I just built and built and built. And it was, they say it's supposed to break you down and make you feel like crap, but it made me feel better, I think, because I knew that I was gonna be in shape. I was gonna know what I was doing. I was learning all these cool things every day. And it, you kind of forget about the, the yelling and all that. and you'd learn to do things in a manner in which you are not going to get yelled at. So <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> I did the OSA, which is your basic and your AIT all at once. And so the basic part where they're yelling at you and you realize how fat you are and everything hurts, that I feel took a really long time. I went in February. Um, and then I graduated the complete thing in July of 09. I thought AIT flew by. Um, I can't remember where the actual split was there, like how long basic actually was in and of itself. But I know once we started doing things related to being military police, it just felt like it flew by. And all of a sudden I was graduating, my family was there. I'm like, I'm going into the army now? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> I'm not ready. <laughs> She was just happy to see me in one piece. She told me I needed to eat a good meal because I was too skinny for her. Um, but no, she had warmed to the idea. She warmed to it pretty quickly. It was a week of just being mad and then she's, okay, you know, you're doing it, so I might as well support you. So by the time she got there, she was soft. We were good to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our specialties we trained in, we did uh, detainee operations and we had little fake prison set up and people would come and role play and we'd have to do searches and just all sorts of stuff as if you were really working in a prison. I'll never do that. But uh, we also got to ride around in patrol cars, which we were all excited about because none of us had driven anything other than a Humvee for months. And so we got to drive these cars and go, they would call in to our radios and tell us where our next location was. Like you go to a parking lot and you 
there was a car there and you had pulled over a suspected drunk driver and you had to do the DUI, the tests and all that and you had to d learn to d direct traffic. <laughs> um, that's pretty much it other than in basic we pretty much covered everything we needed to do um, overseas wise we learned everything then oh, and we got to do our pistol training it went well I actually got 50 out of 50 I was scared out of my mind that was the first time I'd ever held a handgun I had shot shotguns before and all that so I was okay with those kinds of things but I was scared uh, I was scared the slide was going to come back and slice my finger. They had showed us pictures where people let their hand get too high up on the pistol and it sliced their hand open. I was scared out of my mind that that was going to happen to me. And I'd seen videos of people shooting handguns, not the 9 millimeter like we were, but these big like Desert Eagle, like big old handguns, and it comes back and hits them in the face. I thought for sure that was going to happen to me. <laughs> Well, for the most part, uh, the guys were normally guys who wanted to go into security or law enforcement. They wanted to be police officers in the civilian world. So they thought, well, why not get this on my resume, a military police, and vice versa. So they already were police officers in the civilian world. Um, most of them, I think, if they really wanted to be grunts, they would have joined the infantry, but that's my opinion. Um, maybe they just wanted to take it easy, I don't know. Um, the females, there's a lot of different personalities. There were females that just joined and picked that because it was open and they just wanted money for school. And then there, was, there were females like me that, you know, just wanted to get in it and, and go deploy and do all that. And, then there were females that were just there. <laughs> they didn't know what they wanted, so they ended up there. Um, there was a, a huge mix of people, but in the Army I could really tell there were a lot of people like me, loved the outdoors, loved to shoot guns, obviously, and I felt like I fit in there. I was so terrified because I, I'm a picky person, and I didn't think I would get along with all these different personalities. But in boot camp, it really taught me to look at all the things we have in common, you know, it, it, instead of saying, like, you see everybody in the same uniform. Whereas in the civilian world, if I see somebody, you know, dressed up, preppy, I, chances are stereotypical. I don't want to talk to that person, you know, they're too goody for me. But you don't have that luxury in basic training, and you get out afterwards and you see these people on Facebook, you're like, they dress completely different than how I think they would act. Um, so it really opened my mind to that. So I, I got along with a lot of people. I mean, I'd seen it all in Michigan, but <laughs> um, I interacted with a lot, of, a lot of different personalities, and it was really nice to see other people's points of view, and it was really opened my mind. So I, I got to talk to people that I had never said I'd never be friends with that mm -hmm. kind of person. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds horrible, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I really, just the uniform. Again, like you can't tell a lot about a person until they open their mouth when you're all wearing the same thing. So you can't judge anyone until you get to know them. Mm -hmm. So I really think that helped with that. Um, I went to my home unit. I reported in, it was in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I remember my knees were shaking because I was still in basic training mindset where anything that had more rank than me was going to yell at me or make me do push-ups. So I wanted to make a good impression. Um, and I went to my first drill weekend. Um, I actually met a really, what I know now, he's a really good NCO, but at the time he just messed with me. And uh, we went, I believe it was my first show. We went on our a AT, our annual training. We went to Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. Um, at the end of that, our first sergeant pulled us all together and said, hey, um, we got orders. We're deploying next year. Um, so my first drill, I found out the unit was deploying. So that was interesting. Um, I ended up not being on the original list to go and I ended up volunteering, don't tell my mom. 
I ended up volunteering to go on that one and switch places with somebody that that needed to stay state, stateside that had you know young children had already deployed didn't want to do it again so I ended up volunteering to go my whole thing with joining the reserves was they you can deploy more often active duty you know you deploy with with your unit um, in the reserves you can volunteer to go with a different unit if they need you and just go essentially whenever you want so when I found out I didn't have to do anything to go I'm oh, yes I get to go yes this is what I wanted <laughs> for the most part people wanted to go our unit hadn't deployed in a while um, so people were ready they wanted to go and and help out and do their jobs in the reserves you don't you aren't doing anything stateside you just go one weekend a month to it's training and people were ready to do their jobs so there was it was very few people that were like I do not want to go everyone pretty much wanted to go we went to Fort Dix New Jersey I think it was in it was in January that was wonderful it's freezing cold um, and then after that we got we went home for I think a week or two and then we went to Fort Bliss Texas um, that was in the beginning of March and we stayed there and, and left in May we weren't told what we were doing overseas so we just did a little bit of everything <laughs> so um, uh, Fort Dix was mostly qualifying on weapons and making sure everything was good in that department and just doing little exercises and you know scenarios then um, Fort Bliss was obviously all the medical stuff you have to get taken care of and powers of attorney and all that and paperwork and then we just went out in the field and ran these crazy worst case scenario missions where you know you got hit by 50 RPGs and small arms fire and five IEDs all at once and you're sitting there thinking is this really how it's going to be overseas because I'm done <laughs> but that was just a bunch of those scenarios to make sure that you could react mm -hmm. to the worst mm -hmm. oh I told them as soon as I got home from that training when they told us I, I got back to Cincinnati and as soon as I got in my truck to drive back to Lexington I was on the phone with my mom saying I just told them that I was going I didn't tell my volunteer to get switched with somebody I just told them I told them right away though they needed to mentally prepare themselves <laughs> I believe it was what <laughs> already and I said well yeah you know they've been talking about it with this unit for years and I had told her about you know they kept saying they were deploying and then they weren't and then they were deploying and then they weren't and I said so it might it's a possibility that they're going to cancel this one too so I was trying to ease her into it I was like they might you know do the same thing they've been doing to them for years and she goes oh my gosh I have to tell your father and but again gave her a week she warmed up to it she still wasn't happy though <laughs> but she only knew Afghanistan as what she had seen on the news so that's always the attacks this bad thing's happening that bad thing is happening so my parents are both like you know this is it's constantly going on there's no quiet time that's just how the news portrays it, is that something bad is always happening and it wasn't and uh, I, I explained that to her I'm like you know it's probably gonna be quiet the entire time I told her you know I'm going to a big base and probably nothing is going to happen and she said if you say so I said I do mom and she's like okay then I feel a little better but you have to call me every day you know that kind of thing so again it was the worst case scenarios they train you on it's is this gonna happen every day I was excited but I mean it worries you because you obviously you don't want to die over there but it's is it gonna be this exciting the whole time this year is gonna fly by it's gonna be I thought it was going to be very high tempo things are always happening and I thought I was gonna be cool but <laughs> It was intimidating. I remember we had to wait in uh, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we had to wait for a flight in, and we finally got one. I think it was three agonizing days of just torture. I, I wanted to know what it looked like, where I was going to be living. I wanted to get settled in, know my job, um, and. 
we finally landed and I remember when we first, we didn't have to wear our ACHs, our helmets. We didn't have to wear them when we first got on the flight to Afghanistan. And then at some point they said, I think they called it the red zone or something like that. They're like, you know, you need to put on your gear. We're, we're coming into Afghanistan. You have to put on your, your ACHs and your vests. And that's when it really hit me. I'm like, wait, you mean somebody could shoot through this thing even and kill me? Like, that's when it really hit me. And then we landed, of course, and I looked around and we landed at Bagram. So it's 360 degrees of just mountains. And it was beautiful and it was very weird. Uh, how can something so pretty be that bad? And it just didn't feel like we were there yet. It just felt like another stop on the way there. Nothing was happening, everything. I mean, other than all the military planes, it was, oh, look, there's a tent over there. Oh, there's a building, you know, it's pretty built up. Bagram's built up by this point, you know, it's 2010, and it's just another place. It didn't seem like we were there. Uh, when we went to Kandahar, this is my second tour, so I didn't, I guess I expected what happened my first tour, this nice, you know, built up place like Bagram. And then we flew straight into Kandahar, my second tour. And uh, it was, we were at CAF, Kandahar Airfield, and that was just as built up, if not nicer. They had nice restaurants. And um, we waited there for, I want to say a week or two. We had to get flown in on a helicopter to where we were going to live. So we had to wait for those to become available. And, uh, I remember knowing I was a seasoned pro when we were sitting in these big circus tents still waiting at CAF and you heard the alarm for a rocket attack and everyone, I think for the most of the females, for the most part had never deployed before. Mm -hmm. And so everyone's running around getting their gear on and I'm just looking at them with my jaw dropped like, what, what are you doing? And. Uh, my buddy is like, we gotta go to the bunker. That's what we're supposed to do. I said, they only shoot off like one or two at a time. So by the time the second one is landing, you're gonna be right in the middle of everything. And because the bunkers were so far away, it was pointless. I said, just lay back down. You think it's bad when I've heard this, like, you know, there's no ice cream in the freezer. Like that's the worst day ever. Um, so it was, far different than what I had wanted out of a deployment. Um, I We only left it a few times, so I was stuck on base. Just, I mean, it was like being in the city. I, the only thing you had was mortars and rockets to worry about, and they never hit anything. So it was not what I signed up for, if you will. In the beginning of the deployment, um, three days after we got in country, they still hadn't given us ammo for some reason. I don't. We had to do some stupid things, but we had. Uh, it was the May nineteenth, two thousand ten. There was an attack on Bagram, and they, you know, the insurgents were coming over the walls and all that, and it was apparently really big. I didn't know because this is my first tour. I don't know if this is normal. Um, and we had a blackout where nobody could get on the phones, no one could get on the computers. Um, and after they lifted that, so obviously I couldn't call my mom and I wasn't gonna tell her about it, but I wanted to feel her out to see if it was on the news back home. And uh, I got online before I called her. It was I think four o'clock in the morning there. And I see my mom had just posted a status on Facebook, can't sleep too worried. Um, and I said, oh no. She already knows, so I had to call her. And after that, I realized, you know, there's gonna be times where I'm gonna be tired and I'm not gonna wanna call. Um, and there's gonna be times when I can't call. So I decided to make it very sporadic. I'm gonna call, you know, Monday and then not call again till Thursday and then maybe call Friday, but call Sunday too. And so she never got set in a pattern. So my family wasn't, you know, the one day I didn't call, they, and it was because the computer was down, you know, they're gonna think the worst. So after that whole attack and her getting on Facebook and all that, I said, you know, they're, before they ever put it on the news, they're gonna tell you if I'm hurt, you know, just trying to make her feel better. Like, if you see it on the news, I'm fine. Oh, okay. So 
that was, I didn't call my mom every day. And I told her later why I didn't, and she appreciated it. So <laughs> I was sleeping. It was in the early, I can't even, I think it was early morning hours. We were still adjusting to the time. So I have no idea what real time it was there. Um, but we were all sleeping and I remember I heard a boom and I sat up in my cot and uh, opened my eyes and the girl next to me woke up too. Um, and we just kind of looked at each other. And, uh, I don't know. And we had one, one female sergeant in there and this was her second tour. She had a tour in Iraq. So we judged off of her, you know, if she wakes up and she puts her gear on, then we know that's what we're supposed to do. We don't want to be the, the stupid kids that are just, oh my gosh, we're getting attacked and running around base. So um, another boom, and it seemed pretty close to me, but I again, I couldn't judge. It was my first time, and um, that woke her up, and we heard one more, and she grumbles and gets out of bed. She's like, put your gear on. So we put our gear on and go outside, and. I said we didn't have ammo, so they told us to run to the bunkers, but I stood outside and watched the, the sky. I thought it was the coolest thing to see the tracer rounds going over because they were at such an angle that the rounds wouldn't have hit me where I was. Um, and you could see the rockets going over, and I just thought that was when it really solidified. I was standing there, I'm like, those could kill me. I'm really in Afghanistan. I, I'm really here. It took me three days, but now I know I'm really here. I, I think it changed our expectations because for those three days, we were, this is all it's going to be. <laughs> this is so boring. And then that happened and we're like, well, is that what this is going to be like? And everyone's like, yeah, like this is going to be great once we get ammo, <laughs> but this is going to be great. And so everyone expected that to happen. I think for the first month we were there, every noise was like, is it happening again? Like, cause we have finally have ammo. We can actually help this time instead of just standing around looking like idiots. But everyone got really hyped up. Like, I mean, some people got scared too. It wasn't, not everyone was excited that it was like that. Um, but it turned out that, that was pretty much the only thing that happened other than them messing around. Yeah. So everyone got lazy again really quick. <laughs> We, went, we had to go back through Fort Bliss, Texas to DMOB, so we had to go do the rest of our medical and um, kind of turn in gear and all that kind of thing. And I think at the time it only lasted, that tour, it only lasted six or seven days. Um, and we turned in all of our stuff and went home, flew into Cincinnati, and then we got on the bus and I was watching I-75, all the trees go by, and I saw the Ohio River, and wow, we're here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we pulled up and had our coming home ceremony, and mm -hmm. I got to see my nephew for the second time. I got leave during, so I got to meet him. He was born in uh, July of that deployment. Uh, and then I went home to Michigan with my family just to kind of relax and figure out an apartment for Lexington again and get everything reorganized and I ended up only lasting I think three weeks there and I couldn't relax anymore I had to do something I felt worthless so I moved back down here pretty quick <laughs> got back to work right after so I tried my hardest everyone's like you know you just have to relax and then go, you know, slowly go back to work and all this. And I feel worthless. I'm going back to Lexington. My mom's like, <laughs> my parents are, well, where are you going? I'm like, I can't sit still. And so I, I moved back to Lexington and went right back to work. Um, and I realized that I, I wasn't satisfied at all. Um, I didn't get what I wanted out of that deployment. Um, and I, I couldn't, I didn't know how to deal with civilians because everyone asks you, you know, did you do this? Did you do this? And I really, I couldn't talk about my deployment, first of all. And even if I could, it wasn't that neat of a story for people to hear. Um, they wanted to hear about, you know, getting shot at or did you get blown up? Did you see this? And I had sat on the biggest base in Afghanistan, just relaxing, essentially. Um, and I didn't know how to deal with it. Uh, 
and it was really, it was intimidating coming back and having to pay bills, um, write my checks for my bills. My dad had been taking care of all that for me. I mean, he had access to my bank account. He paid my car payment for me. I worried about nothing. I got food for free. Um, I got told what to wear every day, and I had to come back and pick out an outfit. And you don't think that's going to be a big deal, but I had to come back and say, well, this can go with this, and what should I wear to this? I don't know what. And I had to go grocery shopping, fill my truck up with gas, you know. It, everything was very overwhelming. It was just, bam, everything. You had to pay bills, drive your vehicle everywhere to go get something, pay for groceries, and, and I had a dog, take care of your dog, take him for a walk. It was just so much responsibility, which is, it's funny because you think overseas you'd feel more sense of responsibility, but you get told what to do. So <laughs> I decided, I think it was September of 2011, just a few months after I got back, I put in my paperwork with my unit to say I wanted to get picked up by whoever was going. Um, I think somebody told me it was going to take like three months like, and nobody was going to pick me up that fast. So I got a call, I think it was two weeks later, um, that I got picked up for a deployment to Cuba. <laughs> and I said, okay, great. And uh, the next day my commander called me and said, hey, there's a unit from your hometown in Jackson, Michigan that's deploying to Afghanistan, do you want to go on that one instead? And I said, sign me up, I'm done. And they said, well, you start training in November. So I came back, didn't adjust and said, well, forget about it, I'm going right back. So um, we were supposed to be embedded with the Afghan police. Um, so we were supposed to help train them and live with them and eat with them and share everything with them. We we were just all stuck on one place with them. Our job was to just train them. Um, we worked with the Security Forces Assistant Team. It's the SFAT teams. They had um, high-ranking guys. Uh, we had Lieutenant Colonel, a Major, a Master Sergeant, um, and then a civilian law enforcement guy that he was a police officer back home. And we did security for them too. They they were talking, you know, to the commanders of the Afghan police, trying to train them on how to train their troops. Um, so we were, we were supposed to live with them. I was excited about that. I was not as nervous. Um, I was a little more laid back. I'm a jokester when I'm nervous too. So I just told all the jokes and <laughs> just acted like an idiot. But um, I was much more laid back. I wasn't so, oh my gosh, something's going to happen. Because I was used to my first deployment where I didn't do anything. Um, I think when it really hit home that it was going to be different was when we got on the helicopters to fly out to the outpost we were going to live on. Um, then it hit me, you know, I'm not here. The last time we landed, we stopped. That was it. Set up shop and stayed there. Um, this time, you know, you're still dragging all your bags around, putting them on something else, you know, going somewhere else. And we finally, when we landed, I looked around and I'm like, I'm actually outside in Afghanistan. I'm not, I'm not sitting on this huge base. I'm, you know, in some tiny little LZ, like just landing in the middle of nowhere in a dirt pile. Um, so then it brought back all those emotions from the first deployment, like, oh, what have I gotten myself into? Like, I don't know what this is going to be like anymore. Because I had never worked with Afghan police, or, and, and I was on a huge base, and here I am. Our, our platoon was sent to this tiny outpost that just fit our platoon, if that, <laughs> with a whole bunch of Afghan police just surrounding us in tents. And I thought, well, this is what... This is what I signed up for. I want to live in tents. I don't want to have a flushing toilet. This is what I wanted. <laughs> we, uh, well, we moved around. Um, my squad did. Uh, our first, I think it was the first month and a half, two months, we lived at that outpost. Um, and it just depended on the day. You could be sitting in a tower for four, eight hours, who knows. Um, or you could be training with the Afghan police and your, your team and, and all that. It just really depended on the day. Um, when you had off time, I remember we would play with a soccer ball. The Afghan police liked to play volleyball with it. 
And uh, so we would always go play games and just kind of hang out and try to try to build build rapport with them and, and get to know them when we were first there. Um, but then we moved, I think like four times. So we ended up out at a, a different place. So we had to drive back to the place we lived to train the Afghan police and then drive back to the new place we were living. It didn't make much sense, but that's uh, we pretty much moved around and just did the same thing of training the, the Afghan police. We did some joint missions with them. Um, we were supposed to be training the command of these Afghan police, so we were always sitting back and trying to teach the commander how he should, you know, place his troops and what they should be doing. And I remember there was one mission. We said, well, where are your guys at? Because they were out, you know, doing a sweep and clear. And we said, well, what, what, what area are your guys at? Oh, I don't know. How do you not know? And he's like, well, I don't have a radio, you know. And, well, how are you talking to them? How are you going to talk to them? How are they going to call for help? And he's like, we got cell phones. I'm like, oh my gosh. And he just had no idea where his guys were. He just told them to go and who knows if they ever got there, that kind of thing. And that was a, one of the Afghan police, our favorite guy. He ended up stepping on an IED and getting hurt and he blew up his leg and it was just, it really showed you because an IED had just gone off and he was trying to pull security for it and he didn't look where he was going and stepped on the secondary IED. That really put into perspective what point they were at. And so we thought we had a lot of work to do, but um, that was the first time anything had ever happened to me. Like the closest I'd ever been to action of seeing, you know, the IEDs go off and I thought I was cool then, I guess. I don't know. We were all bragging, like, we finally saw something. We're so cool. And looking back, it's, it wasn't cool at all. It was just, I was so bored from my first deployment, and then finally something happened. And I know it's horrible, but I was just kind of like, okay, we're really here. Again, one of those moments where it's like, okay, these things exist. I saw it. Let's go on and, and do the rest of our job. It was more real. Um, we had moved out of that small outpost that we were first in a, a week prior to this happening. Um, when the Afghan police guy hurt his leg, that was, I think, three days before this next thing happened. Um, and we were asleep. It was our day off. It was our maintenance day. We were supposed to take our trucks to you know, to the mechanics and make, you know, check them out and all that. Um, clean your gear, weapons, all that. One of those great days. But um, I remember I felt so lazy because we, we got to sleep in that day. And usually we were out seven days a week. Um, so I felt so lazy and I couldn't sleep anymore. I was like, I have to get out of bed. As soon as my feet hit the floor, I get a knock on my, uh, my door to my tent. And I opened the door and it's my team leader and he said, get your gear on, get to the truck now. Don't ask, just get, you know, the other female awake, get your gear and go. Like, of course I'm griping, like I got to sleep in. It was supposed to be my lazy day. I had laundry to do, you know. So I grab my stuff and I wake her up and we get out to the trucks. Um, and we get told over the radio, you know, we're going back to PR, um, the outpost where we just moved out of. and. Uh, okay, well, why is this, it's like seven o'clock in the morning, why, why are you waking me up right now? I was supposed to be able to sleep until 10 if I wanted to. Um, and they said that they had gotten attacked. That's all we heard. It, it was, you know, my version of attacked was one mortar, one rocket, and then I started thinking of what one would do to that small of a place. Um, and we ended up getting briefed our, uh, our lieutenant colonel pulled us all out of the trucks before we rolled out. And of course me, I'm like, let's go. <laughs> well, what are we talking about? Just go, we'll figure it out when we get there. And he said, well, you guys, uh, the numbers were skewed when he told us, but eventually uh, we had 12 wounded in action out of the two squads that were still there. We had 12 wounded in action. Um, one of the civilian contractors died and then one interpreter died. And uh, we had a guy in our squad, his brother, 
was in the same platoon, but his brother was there and he was with us. Um, so we're flooring it. I was lead truck driver. <laughs> I got yelled at for going too fast and said, look out for IEDs. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> Just let me get there. Um, but that, I, I carried a lot of guilt about that. Um, even on the way there, I was sitting there thinking, I should have been there. There was no reason why we moved to this other place. Like, I should have been there, and I could have done this and that. And um, We finally got there, and one of my friends that um, deployed with me, my first tour, had volunteered to go with me on the second one, and he was one of the wounded. They didn't think he was going to make it. Um, and just the total destruction we saw there was, I mean, there was, the tents were, were all deflated and on top of each other. Um, they threw a, a bunch of grenades um, and also shot up the place they dressed up as, as Afghan police, so nobody thought anything of it. Um, so they did a lot of damage in a few minutes. Um, so we had, there was no tents left. I think the only tent standing was the, out of the six were the interpreter's tents. Um, and just everything. They shot our water tank. There was no water. Uh, we ended up staying there a week to clean up while the rest of our guys went back and kind of <laughs> regrouped before they came back. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, it wasn't, once that happened, it, what was I thinking? I wanted so bad for this kind of thing to happen, but being so naive to the situation, you know, it when exciting things happen, it's not going to be all sunshine and butterflies. You know, people get hurt. Um, and when I wished for exciting things to happen, like, you know, I was excited about that IED going off, you know, three days later, that's what happened. And uh, it really, then you sit there and you think, okay, I'm good. I don't, I don't need any more excitement. Like, if that's what's going to, that's, if that's going to be the result, then no. I would take some excitement with the guarantee of no one getting hurt, but you can't guarantee that. So, oh, everybody was guilty of something. <laughs> uh, we still had to live with the Afghan police and all that, so everyone is always on their toes, and it was just, it was so, it was scary. You didn't know who was wearing a fake uniform and who was real because they go, you know, Afghan police will come in and out. I mean, you'll know everybody one day and the next day there's 10 new guys, three guys left, and you could never keep track of everybody. There was a lot of them there. Um, so it was just constantly watching your back and, and just being scared with every noise you hear. You're sleeping in your tent and you hear, you know, somebody's probably going to walk to the port of John and kicked a rock. You know, it's 3 o'clock in the morning, but you... That's an Afghan police guy with his AK-47 trying to creep up on my tent and kill me. Or, you know, it was just, you, you didn't trust those guys as much as you did. So I guess the insurgents kind of won on that one because that's what they were trying for us to get us not to want to be around the Afghan police so they couldn't get trained. Um, you still did your job. Um, and I was still friendly with them. Um, you didn't let it show. Uh, but you were constantly, at that point, you, you realized you had to have everybody's back. It wasn't, and we did, but it was more important than ever. You just, it was that, that feeling of, okay, that could happen to us. Um, any, anybody that walked around um, near where you were at, you know, you told your buddy, you know, if there was a guy walking behind him, um, you're sitting there watching him, but you also told him, like, in other words, duck if you need to, because I got you. <laughs> um, but it was just, it was nerve-wracking the rest of the time. Um, and nothing else major really happened. I mean, um, a convoy I was on got hit by an IED, but nothing else happened, thankfully. But um, it was just little IEDs and mm -hmm. silly things like that, just messing with us. So. Um, we headed back in January of 2013. So um, we left and we went to Kyrgyzstan again on the way. I was freezing, um, but our commander let us drink, what was it, the two beer limit? And we got to drink the two beers and that was the greatest thing ever, was two drinks. Um, and then we got back into, into Fort Bliss in the, it was mid to end January. Um, and then. 
that took longer there. The transition period at Fort Bliss, they, they changed it. So it took around three weeks this time as opposed to like the six or seven days we had before because they added uh, uh, resume building classes and all sorts of things that were required as opposed to the first time. It was just, you're medically good? All right, go. <laughs> well, we don't want you here. <laughs> this time it was like, we're gonna give you classes because we actually care about you this time. So I was like, come on, I just wanna go home. <laughs> I'd been gone so long, I had a niece and a nephew by now. Um, but it was. Um, my mom, you know, and dad, sister, my brother-in-law, my niece and nephew were all there. Um, and I remember walking off the bus and my, my nephew ran out to me and I pulled him in my arms. And, you know, it was, you, it, it was appreciated a lot more for me. Um, I realized what could have been. And it was better to get home and just see them and say, and we didn't get leave that time either. So we were there for um, a full nine months as opposed to getting a two week leave on a 10 month deployment. So I hadn't seen him in nine months and, and all that those things had happened and I just wanted to hug my mom. That's all I wanted was just hug my mom and dad. Um, so I think I lasted a week and a half, two weeks in, in Michigan that time before I moved back down to Kentucky. I started working, I went to um, one of the horse farms in the area, and I was a, I was a foreman in one of the barns. Uh, all the baby horses, I worked with baby horses and all that, and I realized I just wasn't into it anymore. Um, you don't make great money, you don't have great benefits. Uh, this particular job, I actually had benefits for the first time since I had worked with horses. So, mm -hmm. but I decided, and I'd been thinking about it while I was overseas. You know, I really need to get a degree because I this is not gonna pay my bills when I actually have a house. I'll never be able to afford a house. Mm -hmm. So I lasted there for a few months and then uh, in August I decided I was gonna try to go to school. I'm pretty independent so nobody could have told me to do it. <laughs> I would have done it. Um, I wouldn't have done it just to make the other person mad. <laughs> okay, fine, I'm not going now. Um, I just knew I needed to do it. Um, it was something I had been putting off and I didn't think it was for me, but I was never going to make anything of myself, you know, after the army and all that. I was never gonna be able to pay the bills and have a normal house and all that. Um, so I just, I, I went in and, and asked him what I needed to do. I got my high school transcripts and I went in and well, these aren't good anymore. You graduated in 2007, you know, the ACT scores and all that. And they said, well, you have to go take this compass test. And I said, oh, what? <laughs> and they gave me a little study sheet and I started looking through it and I don't remember any of this. I've been out of school since 2007. Um, and I ended up trying to study a little bit for it. And I went in and took it and they placed me and I talked to an advisor and I got my, my two classes scheduled because I was doing fall two, so it's kind of accelerated. Um, so I decided to just ease into college. I didn't want to overwhelm myself because I hadn't been in school for so long. And here I am. <laughs> my first day um, in math class, I, uh, I walked in and I was, I don't even want to, I was like a half hour early. And I. <laughs> It's just how I'm used to being everywhere early. And so I walk in and there's one other guy in there and I'm like, oh, he must be a veteran. He must be. And I talked to him and he, he was in the army. So it was me and this guy were the only ones in the class, you know, that had served. And it was just immediately we sat next to each other and it was just an immediate, you know, I felt better about it. I wasn't the only one that was going to be there early. Um, and I also found I had a lot, a lot more focus. I would show up and have my homework done and have watched the required videos and all that. And I felt like a goody two shoes because everyone's like, oh my gosh, you know, I didn't do that and all that. And I, well, that's what was assigned to us. I don't want to come in here and not know what's going on. And everyone else, it's like, you know, they're younger kids and it's kind of a joke to them so far. I mean, it's not, serious it's you know some stupid math class I have to take I just got out of high school um, and for me it's like 
okay, I need to study this, I need to do this, you know, I organize everything, I do things early and get it done and review before I go in for the next class so I know exactly what we're learning that day. And I constantly get called on, so I feel like an idiot because he knows that I've done the homework and I feel like such, uh, I can't think of a good word to say for that, but such a suck up. Uh, because I do it, but it's that's what was required of me. So it's kind of tough um, seeing these kids who don't appreciate like what they're doing and how this grade is going to affect them later on. It's like you just want to shake them. Like you're gonna have to take if you don't do your homework now, you're gonna have to take this next semester and the next semester until you finally do your work. So why not get it over with? I don't like math either, um, and. It's just been kind of frustrating. Um, just, I'm not saying I'm the only one that does their work, but seeing some of these kids just come in 15 minutes late, and I'm like, oh my gosh, my NCOs, they would kill me if I came to formation late. Like, somebody needs to yell at these kids. But that's, I think, where the military helped me, as I'm focused in, in school. It's, it's making it a little more difficult because it's just it's frustrating to see people that don't have the same mindset as you do. Um, but in the end, it's I'm the one that's going to school. I'm affecting my own grades. So I kind of have to learn to, to just disregard what everyone else is doing and just know that, you know, I'm doing the right thing. You know, the military taught me how to do this the right way. They'll have to go in the military to get the same kind of training. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I think that having that structure of school um, and they're telling me what to do and overseas you had that structure of people telling you what to do and it's just you just have to look at it in a different way it's not you know mission brief at this time this time this is happening this is what we're doing it's it's uh, you know class starts this time here's what we're going to be covering in class you know this is the end result of you know what should happen during class um, this is what your responsibilities are after class, as opposed to, you know, you need to clean your gear and clean your weapons. It's, you know, do your homework, take this quiz, and it's just you have to find the connection to the military side of things. You just kind of insert school things in your little agenda as opposed to military things. You don't just don't know how to relate to people. Um, in school, a lot of the kids are younger than me anyways. Um, I'm 25, so... Uh, a lot of the younger kids, I know they're not that much younger, but, and I'm not mature by any means, but in certain aspects I am, and I feel like I can't relate to them because, you know, the, it's petty. You, you can't afford a purse. Go get a job and, and go buy it. It's just so simple for me. Um, and so it's really hard to kind of tone it down and not not get angry of about people and petty things and, and all that, and it's you know, not everyone has been in your position, so it's still, I'm still trying to adjust without going back a third time. So mm -hmm. I'm still trying to adjust to realizing that not everyone has the same life experiences and not everyone has had the opportunity to. And trying to remind myself of basic training where I didn't think I could hang out with a lot of different kinds of people. And now I just kind of have to take that and transfer it into the civilian world and and get to know people um, even though they might have a different mindset than me. Maybe I could teach them something, maybe they could teach me something. Um, you don't know until you talk to somebody. Um, I, I think the structure of school um, and my family definitely um, has learned to deal with me. And uh, teachers, they, you know, like I said, they're, they're doing the structured thing and, you know, I don't tell everyone and their brother like oh hey I'm in the military because as a female I have the luxury of not having a buzz cut or you know I don't have a high and tight you can't tell by just looking at me when you walk past me in the hallway that I'm in the military so I don't have to tell you you know um, so I think just not telling a lot of people and just hanging out and you know eventually when you get to know somebody say yeah you know hey I am too you know I'm in the military or I deployed twice or something like that but I think just being around normal people, um, they don't necessarily have to know that you're in the military, just being around normal people and just, just hanging out and spending time with people really, really is helping. It's just, don't look at me as a veteran, talk to me as a civilian so I can get used to being a civilian again. Um, 
you know, I think when I'm done, I'm done. Um, I get out in 2017 officially, completely. Um, I I have other things I want to do. I've served two, two tours, you know, and now those are coming to a close, and it's kind of I don't have anywhere else. I, they need me. Um, and I kind of want to carry on with normal life. You know, I'm, I'm a female. You know, at some point I want to get married and have kids and, and all that, and... I would not want to be in the military when I had a kid and and having to say goodbye to them as a mother. Um, I don't think I could do it. Uh, I'm ready to move on and and start my life as a civilian and and do a normal job and just normal people things. <laughs> think? I just think it's helping me prepare for normal life. You know, the people I'll be around first of all, but you know, going and getting a degree and and learning to be great at one thing, as opposed to being in the military, you got to be good at everything. I can be can be great at one thing, and I can have a career. I can settle down and get a house and all that. So, it, I mean, that that degree really is going to open so many doors. I I challenged myself. I'm really shy, and I'm proud that I challenged myself. And I went to a whole different country, and I lived. I mean, that's what I'm most proud of is like, you know, I survived. Somehow I had that luck, and I survived, you know. And and I did all these things, and I met great people from those countries too that you know are still over there. Um, and I'm I'm very proud to know that I am I'm not as naive as I once was. Um, I'm proud that I joined, um, that I said yes to that, you know. Uh, the call, but I, I'm not, I'm not one to brag. It's not, I'm not going to say, well, you know, in my deployment, I did this, this, and then that's not how I am. It's, I'm quietly proud. You know, I did what I needed to do. I challenged myself, did things I never thought I would do, saw things I thought and wished I never saw. And it's, I'm proud of that, you know.